Welcome. You are about to view a recorded talk of the Mathematical Consciousness Science online seminar series held in 2020. This seminar series aims to explore the role of mathematics in the scientific study of consciousness and hopes to connect researchers who have an interest in this topic. While every session of the seminar consists of a talk and discussions, the latter are not recorded and the following will only contain the talk. We hope you will enjoy it. For further information, please visit our website, seminar.math-consciousness.org. The issue I would like to discuss today is a, a neuronal principle, central neuronal principles that underlie the emergence of, uh, perce of uh, perceptual content in, conscious, um, in the conscious mind. And I will be using faces as my uh, main uh, sort of theme, but I would like to emphasize right from the start that the overall strategy is not to really understand specifically, uniquely how faces are um, perceived or, or consciously uh, experienced, but rather to derive more broad principles of any perceptual content. I'm simply using faces because this is a very uh, convenient, homogeneous set of images that are also represented, as you'll see, in a very selective manner in the brain. So they're very convenient to use as tools, but I would like to convince you that I'm talking here about general principles of conscious perception in general. So the question is, what are the main neuronal principles that underlie the emergence of a face uh, and the appearance of a face in our mind. And uh, before I uh, jump into the results and the argument, <clears throat> I would like to first point out what, what uh, method I'll be talking about mainly. Uh, we are using different methods in my lab uh, which complement each other, but here in this presentation I would like to focus on a very unique and actually quite rare set of data, which is intracranial recordings. This, for those of you who are not familiar with them, these are uh, opportunities uh, for recordings directly from the human brain. These are done strictly for clinical purposes. We as experimental, experimentalists don't have any control over the placement of the contacts. This procedure is done in the pursuit of finding um, uh, the focus of epileptic uh, uh, discharge. And in that attempt, the neurosurgeon often puts many, many contacts directly on the cerebral cortex and also inside the cerebral cortex, which gives an opportunity to uh, record groups of neurons at really unprecedented uh, signal-to-noise level and also at a very high temporal and spatial resolution. We know exactly from which groups of neurons we are recording. We can resolve the, the signals which are basically uh, correspond to the average firing rate in about several thousand neurons. We can follow them at precise uh, temporal delay, which is very important for the dynamics. And very, very important advantage is that uh, we can call the neurosurgeon often puts uh, something like a hundred contacts all over the cortex in an attempt to localize the, the epileptic focus. So we are talking here about a very unique and very um, a high quality um, method that allows us really deep insight into the dynamics of cortical activation. Um, so this will be the method I'll be talking about in general. And before again, I'm, I'll talk about the, the principles. I would like to give you just for those of you who are not uh, familiar exactly, sort of the layout of the human visual system, which is basically the arena I would like to argue is where perceptual, conscious perception uh, happens. So uh, this, what you see here is a schematic uh, presentation of the human visual system looking from posterior, the back of the head, uh, moving uh, uh, front uh, uh, to the front. Uh, this is presented on an unfolded cortex. So we are taking the cortex and flattening it like, um, like um, a geographic map. So you can see in one glance the entire set of visual areas, and you can see that when you do that, basically the entire visual system is arranged as a stacks of layers. Each layer is a visual area, and this is a hierarchical stack. So if we record individual neurons at each level of the hierarchy, we find that the earliest level at area V1, early visual cortex, neurons are selective to elements of the visual uh, image, not to the, uh, for example, to things like uh, uh, oriented borders, uh, edges, and so forth. And as we climb up the hierarchy through 
advancing visual areas going forward in the brain, we end up at the top of that, we get, we record more and more abstract and gestalt-like templates in the neuronal responses until we get to the top layer in the visual system where we find um, entire gestalt templates that are selective for specific categories. So neurons will be selective, for example, to face templates, to templates of places, to templates of body parts, and all these uh, areas are at uh, the top of the visual hierarchy, and from there you move to uh, memory areas and so forth. And in this talk, as I, as I said, we'll be using faces as the model system to try to decipher principles of perception, so I'll be talking about clusters of neurons that we record directly with intracranial recordings that are selective to faces and not to other object categories. Okay, so the first question I would like to ask is what actually endows, what neuronal mechanism, what neuronal principles endows a face with the appearance of the specific face you're looking? This is a very, very fundamental question. What gives the appearance to the images that we are looking at? And I hope the question will be more clear as we move along. So what makes, what principles makes this specific face to us look the way it looks? And, and I, I'll point here that I'm not talking about whether we can recognize this face as John or, or Matthew or whatever. We are simply interested in the perceptual appearance of the face in our mind. So to find out what is, uh, what could be um, the, uh, the principles, we ran a very simple experiment. This was done by Doda Videsco and Shani Grossman, where the patient was presented with a series of visual images that they watch, fixated at the center of the images. And the images included faces, and I'll be focusing on them in this specific presentation, but also other categories of, of images. And the task of the patient was very simple, just to passively watch the, the pictures until one picture repeats twice, and the pa then the patient is required to press a button. If a, if a, a picture repeats twice, it's called one back visual task. So the patient are watching this uh, series of images and we are recording at the same time from electrodes in their visual cortex. And uh, first of all, um, we were interested in finding, Shani was interested in finding, um, where are these uh, face selective contacts located? Where do you, you can find uh, neuronal groups that are selective to faces and not to other categories? And she marked here on the unfolded cortex, you see here the two hemispheres, left hemisphere, right hemisphere, this is the back of the brain. This is the hierarchy of visual areas starting from early visual cortex moving forward. You can see it here on the ventral surface of the temporal lobe. And you see a very nice cluster that all the face selective neurons are clustered, as I said, in the high order areas, front in the brain, or along the temporal lobe. And you see a nice cluster of a large number of uh, uh, contacts, in other words, groups of neurons that are highly selective to faces and not to other categories. And the question is, what happens when you show a particular face to a patient, how these clusters of uh, electrodes behave? And here you see, you know, I, I won't show you all the details and jump, jump to the central uh, finding. Here you see the profile of activation to specific phase. In this case, this is the phase of all the clusters of, elect of neurons that were recorded from, uh, from, a pa from the patients. And for convenience, Shani arranged the electrodes in such a way so the electrode with the highest activation, you see it in the highest bar, is on the left side and with the lowest activation is on the right side. And you immediately can see that despite the fact that all these electrodes are selective to phases, some electrodes are highly activated by this phase and other electrodes are poorly activated, okay? The interesting thing is, what happens if you show additional phases? What happened to this pattern? And what you see is keeping exactly the same set of electrodes. So in all these plots, you have exactly the same set of electrodes arranged in exactly the same manner as this set. You see that for another phase, Merlin Monroe in this case, the, the plot, the profile of activation, of the pattern of activation, in these groups of neurons completely changed. It's as if, you can imagine uh, metaphorically, as if for each phase, there is a sort of a barcode with a specific profile that identifies the, the activation pattern for this phase. And this barcode of activation 
or pattern of activation changes as you move to other phases and you see here another phase. Another th interesting thing that you can immediately notice it, that if you set the, the faces in pairs, you find that certain pairs, for example, this pair of faces, produce rather similar profiles of activation. The pattern of activation, the barcode looks pretty similar. We say that whenever they are close, these are actually short distance. And, and, and for those of you who are familiar with vector representation, this just simply means that in re vector representation space, the point representation of this phase and this phase will be short distance from each other, or in other words, the pattern of activation are quite similar or correlated. However, in this case, the, the activation profile is very different, so we'll say there is a big difference in terms of pattern of activation between these two phases. I hope this is clear. And you can, in fact, go every pair, make all the pair combinations, and generate a matrix of all the distances between all the faces and all, uh, and all other faces, and uh, find out that certain face pairs have short distances. For example, um, um, this pair here have short distance, while other pairs have long distance between them. So we can get a sort of a matrix description of all the distance structures between faces in terms of the patterns of activation in high order visual face selective areas. Why is this interesting? It is interesting because I want to follow on an earlier suggestion by Shimon Edelman and Kalanit Guil Spector that proposed that the appearance of a face in our mind is not determined simply by the pattern of activation of this specific face, but it actually determined by the network of similarities in terms of patterns of activation of this face to all other visual images. So if I present to you schematically, this specific face we started with as a point in a vector space, this is schematically a vector space of only two dimension, of two activity of two neurons. Of course, in the real brain, the, this space will be made up of millions of dimensions for each neuron. But nevertheless, you can imagine that this face is a point then the reason this face looks to us, according to this idea, the way it looks to us is not just because of the patterns of activity it makes, but because this pattern is similar or close or short distance from the pattern that this face generates. It is further away from this face, the pattern that it generates, and it is very far away from these patterns. So the network of distances that we find in the cortex is not just some kind of a random set of distances, it actually defines the way a face appears in our mind. How can we test this experimentally? One interesting possibility that came up in recent years is in fact that we actually have an interesting new model of visual function, visual recognition. This is of course, I hope, and I all assume most of, all of you know about this a very exciting revolution in the development of artificial neural networks that are capable to, to perform visual recognition at the, le at the human level or even surpass it. This uh, uh, neural network called deep convolution networks are basically inspired by this layered structure that I described to you in the introduction. They are also made up of layers of interconnected neurons that are all feed forward and by training the, the connections between these neurons over millions of exposures to, to millions of, uh, of labeled uh, images or faces in this case, the network can learn, adjust its, uh, its um, connections, learns to recognize faces uh, of different parameters, illumination and viewpoints at the level that is better than human performance. So it occurred to Shani to, say, to ask, if this matrix of connections that I described to you, distances between pairs of faces that we find in the human brain, if it's not just some kind of a random noise pattern that emerges in development, but if it has a real uh, functional significance, then we would expect that maybe the artificial network will show the same kind of safe space geometry, or in other words, the same kind of matrix of distances when we show this network the same faces that we showed to the patient. So the experiment is actually very simple. You feed the network, the deep neural network, in this case, a network that is specialized 
in recognizing faces, you feed it with the same faces that the patient saw, and for each layer in the network, you can generate the same matrix of, uh, of distances as the one that I showed you for the human brain. And you can e simply ask for each layer of this network, do we find a similarity between the distance matrix in the artificial network and the distance net matrix that we find in the human brain? If, if we find such uh, similarity, I will argue this cannot be attributed to chance. You're talking about here two completely different system, the, the human brain, artificial network, that perform a similar function, face recognition, and this, uh, what we call convergent evolution, similarity in distant matrix, indicates to us that this is an important factor, not some kind of uh, random or arbitrary um, distribution. And indeed, when Shani compared for each layer, what you see here is a set of the layers of the deep convolutional networks, starting from the first layer, which is the input layer, and the ending up at the top layer, which is a person recognition layer. This is the layer that says, this is John, this is Smith. And what she correlated, the distance matrices in each layer for the same faces that we showed to the patient, that if she found a striking correlation in a specific set of layers. Interestingly, these were not the early visual cortex-like layers that are dealing with just elements of the visual, system, uh, visual image. These were not the layers that are associated with the actual recognition. These were layers that you might call them more pictorial. In other words, they fit with the idea that these uh, networks of distances that we found in the human brain are actually underlying the appearance rather than the recognition of the individual. So this was the first indication that in fact there is something uh, significant, functionally significant in, the, in this, uh, in this uh, distance matrix that we found in the human brain. Another very straightforward prediction that comes from this idea is that if you have three images, two of them look to you perceptually to be very similar, like these two images, they look very similar to each other and they look very, very different from these two images. So a very simple prediction will be if we now go to the brain and we ask what are the patterns activated by this, this, and these images, we will predict that these patterns should be closer to each other, shorter distance, more similar compared to this pattern. And this was tested by Doda Videsco. We actually collected the data from the human brain in the United States, in the lab um, in, of uh, Professor Ashesh Mehta in uh, Long Island, and we did the perceptual test of similarity and dissimilarity at the Weizmann Institute. So we are asking here not about individual perceptual distances, but a sort of a canonical representation of the faces that crosses um, uh, countries and, and cultures. And um, what the, the way we tested the perceptual similarity was very simple. We cut the faces that were shown to the patients in the United States onto cardboards, and we asked the, the students to simply put all the pairs of faces in such a way that faces that appear to them to be very dissimilar to each other, they'll put at long geometrical distances between them. So this, for example, pair of images were placed at a long perceptual distance. They were placed far apart from each other. And two faces that appears to the students to be very close, they put them at very short distance between them. So these, for example, two faces received a very short uh, presentation they would put closely indicating that they appeared very similar, as you can judge for yourself, um, uh, when shown to the students. On this axis, we plotted the pattern similarity of the different pairs of, of images. Uh, and what you can see is that there is a nice correlation. Uh, pairs of faces that generated patterns that were very dissimilar from each other uh, were perceived as dissimilar by the students and patterns that uh, were very similar in the brain of the patients were also perceived as similar uh, perceptually. And the, uh, the correlation was even strengthened when we looked just at those electrodes that showed the most high uh, reliable responses. Importantly, you cannot attribute this effect 
to some low level contrast, gray level edginess in the, uh, in the images, because if you look, uh, just like with the deep convolutional network, if you look at early visual areas, the, you don't find any of the correlation. So you cannot attribute this pattern similarity to some kind of low level aspect of the images. So to summarize this uh, first part of the presentation, I would like to suggest that the appearance of a conscious visual image is defined by its pattern of activation in high order visual cortex, but not only the unique pattern of each phase, but also how similar or dissimilar or how close or distant this pattern is to all other activation pattern. So the appearance is actually defined by similarity distances, or to put it differently, to in the geometric location of the specific phase within the geometry of the image activation space. The next question I would like, the next principle I would like to discuss is a, is a more fundamental question, and that is the question, what underlies the transition from uh, from seeing a face to not seeing a face, or what underlies the appearance of a, of a face in our conscious uh, mind. And, and in, in, instead of trying to define it, you know, in a very, very precise manner, I just want to illustrate to you what I mean by giving you, giving you an illustration of a face like that popping in your mind. And this is what I have in mind when we are searching for the neuronal uh, principles that underlie this process. So if you look at this picture, you see probably some kind of a bouquet of nice flowers, purple flowers. But if, if I pop, point your direction, you'll notice suddenly that there are faces in this image. For example, this is a face. There's another face here. And I hope you could also see a third face. It's right here. And notice what happened. Suddenly, for those of you who didn't see the faces right away, suddenly there was a click-like phenomena where suddenly you transitioned from not seeing a face to seeing a face. And the critical point to notice here is that nothing changed in the physical properties of the image. I didn't change anything in the physical optics of the image that arrived into your eyes, and the image of a face suddenly clicked into your mind. And the question I'd like to discuss now is what are the neuronal principles that underlie such clicking of a face appearing from a non-face uh, situation without a change that cannot be attributed to a change in the physical properties of the stimulus. Now, in order to uh, examine this question in a more precise manner, we didn't uh, use this um, popping out that I described, but we use another method called backward masking. And uh, the advantage of this method, it allows you to precisely pinpoint the timing uh, of, the, uh, of the event of the presentation and the timing of the conscious event. And the way it works is that you're presented, presenting a target, in our case, a face image, but you can, of course, present any other target. For a very brief uh, period, for something like a fraction of tw 20 milliseconds, and you immediately follow it with a high contrast mask. <clears throat> now, if you titrate the distance between the mask and the target, you can create a situation that with very little change in this distance, sometimes you will see the image. In that case, you'll say, aha, I see a face. You detect the target. Or sometimes you'll just see the mask. In that case, you'll say, I failed to see the target. And I just want to give you a feel of how uh, it looks like. And we'll give, I'll show you a backward masking demonstration. In each presentation, there will be a target, not necessarily a face in this case, but often a face. Uh, followed by a mask. And at first, I'll give you a very short distance between the target and the mask, only 40 milliseconds. And this will be difficult to detect. But believe me, there will be a target every time a mask appears. Let's see. I hope it will work. Yes. So probably most of you did not see the, the, any target because this is too fast for you to see. But we'll make a slight change in the, in the distance between the target and the, and the mask, this time 80 milliseconds, very, just a fraction of a second more. 
And some of you by now, maybe if you have sharp eyes, may be able to see a flicker or even the target. It also improves with practice, by the way, you can study that as well. And now I'll give you 200 milliseconds that hopefully, uh, with the, depending on, of course, the zoom conditions, you might uh, hopefully be able to see the target. So you can see that by titrating very carefully the, the distance between the target and the mask, I can create a situation that with almost no physical change in the stimulus, I create a condition where sometimes the patient, this was done with the patients, and I can create a condition when sometimes the patient sees the image and says, aha, I see a face, or sometimes they fail to see it and say, no, I just see the, the mask. While I'm recording in these face selective electrodes in high order visual area, and I show you so kind of an average response of a, a number of such uh, face contacts that were face selective. Here you can see the presentation. You see very short time followed by a long mask. And notice the big difference that you, you see uh, between the, those cases when the subject said, I see the face, which is here in, in red and the, fa the cases where the subject says, sorry, I failed to see the, the image, and you see this is uh, in, in blue. Two major differences. First, you see there is a major amplification in the signal. Conscious visual perception in this phase selective electrode is associated with an amplification of the signal compared to the non-visible condition. But even more important, notice the dynamics. The presentation was here for 20 milliseconds. It was quenched completely on the retina by the mask. And you can see that the uh, activation keeps reverberating for hundreds of milliseconds after the image is already gone. Whenever we see such reverberating persistent activity, the first suspect is recurrent positive activation among uh, uh, neighboring neurons. This, uh, of course, will explain also the amplification of the signal because they reinforce the activation beyond the initial stimulation. Notice that this entire network is under tight inhibitory control, otherwise it will explode into epilepsy, of course. But even within this tight control, there is a reverberation going on that keeps going, keep the signal going uh, on and on and on for hundreds of milliseconds. And it is probably mediated by this vast and very intense network of lateral connections that are binding these uh, groups of neurons together. So my argument, my suggestion is that this difference between uh, perceiving an image and not perceiving an image is associated with the recurrent activation of groups of neurons, not all over the brain, I'll be talking about it later, but within these areas that are face selective that I was talking about, high order visual areas. Now, why, why this recurrency is so important? First of all, it of course magnifies the signal, but I would like to point to an interesting uh, aspect that is worth thinking about. It's conjectural, but I think it's very uh, interesting. I was sort of, uh, you know, without thinking, mentioning that I'm, I'm proposing that there is a space, there is a, a visual face space, let's say, or, or shape space that emerges in the, in the human brain that is made up of a group of neurons that define the dimensions of the space. But if you think about it, this space or this pattern of activation that I talked about in the previous part of the talk is a completely artificial contract made by me, the experimenter. I am the one that is looking at the brain from outside, collecting activation patterns and, this, and defining them as an interesting space that indeed I try to convince you that it uh, has a functional meaning and it makes sense and so forth. But from the point of, uh, point of view of the brain that doesn't know that somebody is looking at, uh, at it from outside, from the intrinsic point of view of the brain, what makes, what binds all these neurons that are activated into one meaningful functional space? What makes them a group that is a sort of can, you can, um, you can sort of legally or, or functionally talk about as defining a point in space when you're showing you, um, a face? I would like to propose that this recurrent activity among all the neurons that, con that are activated by these images, 
is the mechanism that is actually binding these neurons into dimensions of a meaningful space. This is what makes these neurons behave as a meaningful representation and justifies saying, aha, I'm looking at this, uh, this uh, uh, phase as a sort of a joint activation of two neurons. It's a joint activation because they generated the recount activity. This is, of course, a conjecture, but I think it is worth thinking about. So to summarize this part, uh, I would like to suggest face perception is associated with amplified and persistent ignition localized to the face selective visual areas. I would like to suggest that the ignition is likely driven by local current recurrent positive feedback locally, and it is, I propose that it might serve as a binding mechanism for including all the separate neurons that are recurrently activated in, into a meaningful functional image space. Now I'd like to touch on a very controversial point that are probably a lot of you know about, and this is the question, how local or how global are the neural mechanisms that underlie conscious visual perception? And again, I would like to focus on the emergence of content in the conscious mind, um, and I'm not going to talk about issues of metacognition and so forth, although the, it might be relevant what I'm talking about uh, to these issues. So I'm basically asking a very simple question. I talked about recurrent activity within visual area, high order visual areas, but is it sufficient? Is it the, the central element that is actually underlying the emergent of face concept, or do you need additional more global activation, both in early visual cortex and high order visual areas. So let me start by asking whether we need a recurrent activation into early visual cortex as a prerequisite to have a perceptual image in appearing in our mind. There are interesting theories and suggestions by Victor Lame, for example, that argue that the essence of perceptual, um, a conscious perception is not only the activation in high order areas, and not only the activation in early visual areas, but the recurrent loop going from high order areas back to early visual cortex. So we wanted to examine the question of the human brain. This, this suggestion came from monkey studies. And if you think about it, how can we study the involvement of V1, early visual cortex, in conscious perception? You must find the visual illusion that dissociate the physical stimulus that of course drives neurons in early visual, visual uh, areas from the perceptual aspect. Just like I showed you this example of a popping face that dissociated the physical that didn't change from the perceptual that did change with the popping of the face. So we're breaking our head what could be a good illusion that on the one hand blocks completely all physical input, optical input into the human brain on the one hand, and on the other hand, you are totally oblivious to this blockage. And together with we came with the idea to use spontaneous blinks. Spontaneous blinks occur every five seconds approximately. They include complete closing of the eyes. You completely block all visual input to your eyes. And nevertheless, you are completely oblivious to the fact that you are blinking every five seconds. I will challenge you to try to remember when you blink during my, my talk. Uh, this is something we are completely unaware of until you know, you, you, somebody brings it to your attention. So it's a beautiful, uh, we call it ecological illusion that on the one hand produces a very striking blockage of the visual input to the human, uh, to the eyes and to the brain. On the other hand, we are completely oblivious to this uh, illusion. And if you want to argue that the reason you don't see your eye blinks is because they are too fast. In other words, the blinking is too fast for us to perceive. Uh, Tal Golan prepared this beautiful illustration in which he tied this video image that you see here to the blinking of a very carefully measured blinks of a student. So what I'll be doing here, I'll be blocking the visual input from this part of the screen to your eyes in conjunction with the blink. In other words, I'm simulating the optical flow that happened during a blink, we will call this a gap and we'll be using it in the experiment and ask yourself if you can see those gaps in the visual stream or not. 
So I hope, I hope uh, uh, all of you saw the gaps very clearly. So we have a, a very nice situation where we have two conditions. On the one hand, we have spontaneous blinks in which you have blockage of the optical stimulus without any conscious experience of this blockage. And on the other hand, we can simulate those blinks by blocking the visual input and we can check what happens in early visual cortex and contrast it with high order visual areas. What happened during the gaps? I remind you, gaps are blockage of the optical images that are similar to the blinks, but you are perfectly capable of seeing them as opposed to the spontaneous blinks that happen without you seeing them becoming completely blind. So we simply ran a simulation, gap simulation, and, and measured spontaneous blinks in the patients. And I want to show you briefly some of the results. This is a recording in the early visual cortex, either V1 or V2, we are not sure, but early visual cortex for sure. Nice visual responses. And this is the response that you record in this specific contact in early visual cortex to the gaps. We can tie it to the onset of the gap, we can tie it to the offset of the gap, and you see that in this specific contact, there is a very strong, robust response, decreasing response for the onset of the gap and increasing response to the offset of the gap. This is a typical response in early visual cortex. But this is not surprising that you see this nice response because you have both a change in the optical stimulus, but also a change in the perceptual state. So, of course, we are not surprised. The critical question is what happens in this electrode when we uh, do the spontaneous blinks. And here you see very strikingly that early visual cortex is completely oblivious to the fact that you are totally blind to the fact that there were blinks here. Despite the fact that you, as an observer, as a reporting observer, you are not conscious of these uh, spontaneous blinks, early visual cortex simply follows the optical stimulation uh, and ignores the fact that there is a major perceptual change <clears throat> between the visible gaps and the invisible gap in the optical flow. And notice, now we'll, I'll show you high order visual area, and notice the dramatic change as we move upwards in the hierarchy of visual representation. This is a phase selective cortical region during the blinks. No response whatsoever. So the high order visual area follows beautifully the fact that we are completely in the, the spontaneous blinks are completely invisible to us. If I now look what happens in the visible condition, an interesting finding is that what we see is that in high order phase selective areas, there is no response to the gap proper what you see is a response to the re returning image of the face, and you see it beautifully. So a, a gap, if you think about it, consists of disappearing of the face, which is not reported in this, uh, in this sites, and reappearing the f of the face after the gap, and you see a beautiful ignition happening when the face reappears, and you can see a striking discrepancy between the perceptual state and the non-perceptual state, despite the fact that the physical ch changes were identical. So this leads me to, to argue that activity in early visual areas is linked to the physical stimulus, but it is not underlying or linked to changes in conscious perceptual content. Of course, you need early visual cortex to be a conduit for the, for the visual stimulation when uh, you open your eyes and look at the world, but in terms of the perceptual state, it does not play a role, and I'll remind you that you can have visual perceptual state without uh, stimulation of the eyes, for example, during vivid visual dreams. Um, so this is the, um, the summary we get from this part of the, of the results. And the last question I would like to discuss uh, is question of global workspace uh, ignition. This is a very elegant idea that is very, um, dominant in the field, proposed by Stan de Haan. And the argument is that uh, face or, or uh, visual perception is not necessarily associated just with an ignition within high order visual areas, but in fact, the essential uh, principle or essential uh, event that leads to our ability to perceive a visual image is not the local activation in high order areas, but a global ignition 
that is based on recurrent activity across front of parietal cortex in addition to the visual. So we were very interested in this question and we wanted to ask it in uh, doing an experiment. And I want to, to, and we ran a very, very simple experiment uh, because we realized that one back recognition task that I described in the beginning of the talk actually is a nice um, sort of means to try to understand what is the actual functional selectivity of frontal cortex compared to visual cortex um, when we are trying to understand what really is the specialization of different cortical areas in terms of visual perception. I want to explain what I mean. Usually studies that try to ask whether there is a common spread of activation associated with perception or a local spread are trying to find conditions in which they can isolate very purely just the perceptual aspect or just the uh, non-perceptual aspect. I think this is a futile attempt. You can never really isolate in the human mind a, an element to be completely devoid of any other element. And it's also non-productive uh, non because the cortex at least is a highly interconnected network and every event that happens anywhere in the brain will be spreading like fire at a low level to other cortical areas, including the front, the back, parietal, and so forth. I think the interesting question, the important decisive question, is what is the functional specialization of an area? I, I pointed to you in the uh, visual area in cortex that each region has its own specialization. You have specialization for face selectivity, you have spe specialization for edges and so forth. And the question is, what is the specialization of frontal parietal cortex in terms of visual perception? And the one back is a very neat way to explore it because if you think about it, it has two major components to it. If you're presenting different images to the patient, as I rem remind you, the patient is just passively watching those images. But whenever an image repeats twice, then on the second image, the patient has to report by pressing a button the fact that there was a repeat. So you, you can see here that this allows us to study what is the functional specialization in the brain for the reporting element in the, in the task and for just watching the images. So we basically ran this experiment uh, with Niv Noy on, a, on, a, on the patients. And I want to first show you to illustrate the main finding with this uh, video. What you see here is an unfolded hemispheres of uh, the patient where we accumulated all the recordings from all the patients. There are, I think, more than a thousand recordings, if I recall right. Each of these dots that you see here is a contact recording from a group of neurons. We, and I'll show you a video that will show you first the activation in the cortex to the presentation of uh, two different images. So I remind you, the patient does not need to press a button when they're looking at them. And then the third image will be a repeat. And then you could see what happens when the patient is in the brain, when the patient is pressing the button. I remind you, this is the visual um, cortex. This is frontal, this is parietal. I apologize for the unfolded uh, presentation, but it's very convenient because it shows you in one glance the entire cortex. Every time an electrode will be activated, it will turn into a pink or a, a, a red um, color. And uh, we slow the presentation very, very slowly so, uh, so you could see, the, you could see the, um, uh, the activation carefully. So this is the first image. Notice visual cortex lights up like a fire. This is the ignition I was talking about. Notice how it continues after the image disappears. Pretty soon there will be another image, a different image. So the patient is just watching, is not doing anything. Again, pretty soon you'll see activation. Notice also frontal parietal. There is a little bit of activation in frontal parietal. So if you want to, be, to argue for a global workspace, you have some activation here. But if you want to uh, discuss functional specialization, notice this image that is a repeat, and now the patient has to press a button. You see the activation in early visual cortex, but notice what happens, the high activation that now the ignition, that now finally happens in high order frontal parietal uh, areas. And these are uh, 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 activation that are selective to the decision to press a button and to the preparation and so forth. This was just to give you a feel 
And here is the quantitative analysis of all the contacts. In this case, we color coded them according to how modulated, how functionally selective they were for the report versus the no report condition. And uh, electrodes that are colored in yellow are the ones that were particularly selective for the report rather than the, uh, the mere perceptual viewing. And you can see this is the, the back of the brain, the visual cortex. This is frontoparietal regions. You see that the majority of yellow contacts are in the frontoparietal region. Clearly, the frontoparietal regions are generally uh, dominated by report. Of course, there are within them, like in all biological presentation, some exceptions that might play a very uh, important role. I'm not arguing against it, but the overall picture that appears is that the frontoparietal cortex is dominated by reporting aspect. It's functionally selective for this, not for the visual content. If you are interested in the visual content, here is an analysis that asks simply which electrode was selective to, it was highly selective to a specific category, let's say faces compared to other categories and so forth. And you see that now all these electrodes that are selective are all in the visual cortex. Very few electrodes in the frontal part of the brain are functionally selective for the content of visual experience. So I think the, the conclusion is quite clear that we are asking about dominant parameters. We are asking about functional selectivity. Frontal pattern networks are specialized for high order functions like decision making, motor preparation. We have some data on metacognitive functions, but they are not selective for the conscious perceptual content. So to summarize my entire presentation, perceptual content is defined by local patterns of neuronal activation. And we argue the appearance of an image is defined by the similarity of this pattern to all other patterns. It's as if you have some kind of a grid of definitions that are defining and placing each image that you have within a specific location in a vast space of possibilities and the distances to all other images together cooperatively is defining the appearance of this, uh, of this image. The emergent of a specific content like a face in consciousness is linked to a local ignition, which is a high and sustained activity within the groups of neurons that are selective for this content. So for example, I will argue extending this idea that if you are, for example, becoming sensitive of uh, motion, visual motion, then you'll see ignition in, a, in neur neurons, high order neurons that are selective for visual motion and they will be ignited. And this ignition is likely mediated by a recurrent signal exchange uh, mediated by lateral connectivity within the domain of high order visual areas, not recurrency back to early visual cortex and not recurrency to frontoparietal regions, but within the relevant uh, cortical areas. Again, it's important to, to emphasize that if the, the perceptual exper experience includes not only visual aspects, but for example, if you are in a movie and you are uh, experiencing both vision and audition, then of course we will expect to have ignition both in the auditory, high order visual area, uh, auditory areas and high order visual areas. And this ignition should somehow be uh, grouped together, perhaps through recurrent activity. So we are not saying that um, uh, conscious experience is always associated with the local activation. And of course, if you are doing some kind of introspection on this visual image, then you will have frontal areas also igniting in relation to the introspective activity. But you can get conscious perception also localized if the experience, the perceptual experience is very limited and very selective, let's say to a specific phase and so forth. I'm, as I said, I, I propose that the recurrent activity is binding from the point of view of the brain an assembly that we only see it from outside, but that does not mean anything. An assembly can appear to our eyes, can maybe even give some interesting results. You know, there's a lot of interest in multivariate representations, but they're all uh, assuming that this multivariate that we are recording from outside with fMRI, with other methods, is actually known 
and being utilized by cortical net networks themselves, you must find a mechanism that is binding this uh, different neurons activity into an intrinsic assembly, an assembly that is sort of relevant and functional from the point of view of the brain. And I will argue that the recurrent activity might serve as such a binding mechanism among isolated neurons. And I would like to argue that each cortical domain has its own function. And early visual areas have their function. They have a function probably in pre-processing, in conducting uh, the photic uh, information, in maybe selecting incoming information through attentional mechanisms. But they are not involved in conscious perception of, uh, of uh, visual content. And frontoparietal networks are specialized for their own metacognitive tasks, decision tasks, strategic a reward, arousal, attention, memory, but they're not uh, uh, directly uh, underlying the appearance of uh, visual contents in perception. So uh, thanks for listening. I want to not forget men to mention the students that actually uh, obtain all the data. Niv Noy in particular, I mentioned them, Shani Grossman, Ido Davidesco, Recordings were mainly in the Professor Ashesh Mehta's lab. Michal is the uh, manager of the lab, Tal Gulan, um, and Shani Grossman, I think I mentioned. Thank you. I'm open to questions now.